हेलो एंड वेलकम टू बाईजूज एग्जाम प्रेप आई एस अ वेरी वेरी वॉर्म गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन आई होप ऑल ऑफ यूर डूइंग गुड आई वेलकम यूर द बिगनिंग ऑफ द हिंदी न्यूज पेपर लिस सेशन फॉर टूडे आई होप योर प्रिपरेशन इज गोइंग राइट ऑन ट्रैक एज ऑल ऑफ यू नो द यू पी एस सी नोटिफिकेशन इज ऑलरेडी आउट आई होप दैट ऑल ऑफ यू हैव गॉन थ्रू द नोटिफिकेशन प्लीज मेक इट अ पॉइंट टू रीड इट वेरी वेरी क्लियरली स्पेशली द इम्पॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स विद रिस्पेक्ट टू इफ you require certain certificate for having reservation etc make sure that you fill up your form much before the last date that is 21st of february but make it a point to read the notification very very carefully it will give you a lot of very important information you know that this year there are over 1100 vacancies announced by the upsc so that is a good news because we have seen in the past how the number of vacancies have gone below 1000 also so this may be the year where you can make it count because a lot of things are going in your favor and to make that happen you know every single day at 10 am we are here for you to bring you the most important news stories from the hindu newspaper of the day all that you have to do is make sure that you are subscribed to this youtube channel and also attempt the daily quiz based on the hindu newspaper as soon as the session ends on our telegram channel so without waiting any further i would also like to remind you that on 4th of february that is tomorrow we have a live workshop for all of you at 6 pm where samar sir will be discussing the complete guidance of how to qualify the upsc examination your very first attempt this is a workshop where you get to ask your questions live from the experts anything regarding your preparation in order to attend that workshop you have to have the byju's exam prep app do remember If you have not downloaded the app till now, do download it and tune into this workshop tomorrow at 6 p.m. Without waiting any further, let's see what are the important news stories. Now, as you know, the budget and the economic survey just came out a few days back, and that is why, as expected, the newspaper, the Indian Express, the Hindu newspaper, all of these are filled with a lot of articles about economic survey, about the budget, the different government schemes, the expenditure, etc. today's hindu newspaper also if you do read it carefully it has a lot of topics about the government expenditure which sector has got how much money so on and so forth so for the next few days be ready to get a heavy dose of economics be ready to get a very very heavy dose of government schemes because a newspaper will be filled from this the first topic that we have here is on the theme that if you look at the entire world right now the one area of the world where economically the progress is being seen very well as compared to other parts is asia in simple terms the suggestion here is india and other asian countries rather than looking towards the western nations we should focus more on asia because we have to understand how exactly is it that we can take advantage of asia and our neighbors the author here says If you look at the GDP growth numbers, if you look at the inflation problem, the Asian economies, be it the South Asian economies such as ASEAN, be it the Southeast Asian economies, all these economies are better placed as compared to the developed world in the Western nations. And this is why, as per the author, it is time to focus more on Asia. The IMF also has the same kind of numbers that they have come out with recently. For example, IMF has said that global trade will slow down from 5.4 percent to 2.4 percent in 2023. The only strong areas where the global trade will still go strong, as per the IMF, is South Asia and Southeast Asia. Now, just to give you an idea, when you say South Asia. you mainly mean the sark nation that is india bangladesh sri lanka there will be maldives pakistan bhutan nepal bangladesh these kind of countries when you say south east asia that is when you talk about the asean nations mainly and you also include china in that as well so that is how you usually distinguish between the two areas now <clears throat> indian government has realized this way way back i am sure all of you have read about india's look east policy act east policy since 1991 the government of india has realized how important it is to have good relations towards the eastern side as well historically we have been very attracted towards western countries we all think the western world the western nations are the most developed ones till 
that era of 1991, that was an era from our independence 1991 that India was mostly focused on having better relation with the Western nations. It was only after 1991 that we realized there's a lot of potential in Eastern side of India as well. That is when we started focus on the ASEAN nations. Since then, India has expanded its growth of relations with ASEAN nations and other nations in that area, be it Japan, be it South Korea or even Australia. As per the global numbers, the total merchandise trade between South Asia and East Asia has actually reached $332 billion. A lot of free trade agreements have also been signed. Meaning that now the Asian countries are realizing they don't have to depend on developed nations outside Asia. They are sufficient to trade amongst themselves. There are many examples of free trade agreements being signed. The latest one, and I'm sure all of you know, would be RCEP. Have you heard about this? RCEP. Tell me this, by the way, is India a member of RCEP or not? Let me check your knowledge first. Is India a member of the RCEP or no? Yes, as many of you are rightly saying, India is not a member of the RCEP. We'll discuss in just a bit why are we not a member of RCEP, what is the problem here. But India right now is not a member of the RCEP. Now, in this article, the author is giving certain suggestions. The author is saying that on one hand, Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia specifically, is very well placed to be the leaders of the global market in the coming years. However, there are certain things that we need to do. So there are certain suggestions. What are those suggestions? First big suggestion. We have to ensure that we reduce trade barriers. Now what are trade barriers? See, trade barriers are of two types. There are tariff barriers. Tariff barrier means if we increase, let's say, our taxes so much, if we say we are importing mobile phones to India, we will put 50% taxes on those. That is how the demand for that mobile will come down. That is called a tariff barrier. Then there are non-tariff barriers as well. Non-tariff barrier doesn't really mean that the government of India will increase taxes. That means that government's policies will be such that we will favor our own producers much more as compared to products coming in from other countries. So we might give subsidies to our own local manufacturers. As per the author, tariff barriers should reduce. We should encourage trade from one country to the other country. Second idea. Most countries in South Asia have their own SEZ. What is SEZ? SEZ are special economic zones. Special economic zones. As you know, these are areas specifically made to give a push to economic activities. There are special rules, special regulations that are in place for the SEZ. Many companies who set up their offices in these areas are given tax exemption as well. However, the problem here is in these SEZ, we have not been able to utilize them as much as some other countries have. We have an SEZ or more than one SEZ in India. We have in Pakistan also, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. But we have not been able to give it the kind of infrastructure and facilities that would attract more companies. We should ensure much better infrastructure, more reliable electricity, 5G connectivity, etc. So that we can actually push more companies towards opening up offices here, give a boost to economy even further third idea or third suggestion by the author. India should be forward looking and should sign as many free trade agreements as possible. Now this is a very interesting problem. Just understand this very carefully. Historically, India has been a country where we have not really been in favor of many free trade agreements. In fact, globally, many countries think it is very futile to negotiate with India because India never signs a free trade agreement. That was an image that India had. Now, there was a reason for that image. The reason why India did not sign many free trade agreements was because we were never sure how would it impact our farmers and small scale industries. For example, we thought if we let's say sign a free trade agreement with China. Now, cheap Chinese products will come to India. We can't even impose taxes on them. The local Indian consumer will buy Chinese products only. Then what will happen to Indian farmers? 
what will happen to Indian MSMEs. So fearing that, thinking that our own market, our own domestic market won't be able to compete with other companies coming in from outside, India usually was very, very skeptical about signing any free trade agreement. In fact, whenever India wanted to sign a free trade agreement, India usually wanted free trade agreement in services only. <clears throat> As you know, if you compare goods and services, India's strength has always been services. Services of different kind, for example, IT services like Infosys, TCS, BPO, KPO, consultancy, all these are services. India has always been very strong in services. So we were always in favor of signing a free trade agreement with services. For example, we want our companies such as Infosys, TCS to get clients in China also because we know we are very strong in that. But we did not want Chinese products to come to India. That is why India was never really a country that signed a lot of free trade agreements. That is why we did not even sign the RCEP. And we'll come to RCEP in just a bit. However, that has changed recently. If you have been reading the news, the government of India has signed multiple free trade agreements in the past few years. For example, with UAE, we have signed a free trade agreement. With Australia also, we have a free trade agreement. We are in talks to have a free trade agreement with UK. With EU also, negotiations are ongoing. So that is a welcome change. As compared to earlier, the Indian government now is more open to signing free trade agreements. That is a good way forward. Fourth suggestion that has been given. We should focus on other groups such as BIMSTEC. If you have noticed this, in the past few years, the government of India has been putting a lot of focus on BIMSTEC as compared to SARC. Now, in SARC, there are many problems. The biggest of them being that Pakistan is a member which does not let the SARC function properly. They boycott the meeting. Many countries don't like Pakistan. So India has been focusing a lot on BIMSTEC. However, we have not been able to have a proper BIMSTEC free trade agreement. So having that also will be very, very, very helpful. These are the important pointers from the article. Now, let me share with you some other information specifically about the RCEP. Now, RCEP, as <clears throat> you know, it stands for Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Let me write it here. <clears throat> Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This is a free trade agreement mainly led by the ASEAN nations. So ASEAN, as you know, is a group of 10 nations in Southeast Asia. ASEAN nations, apart from them, five other members have signed this agreement. Those five members are China, then there's Australia, there is Japan, there is South Korea, and apart from that, there is New Zealand. Now, all these nations that have come together, the interesting part was even India was actually a part of the negotiations. It was expected till the last stage that India would sign it. But in the end, India said on the last day, no, 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 we will not sign it. Why? India had many concerns. And I'll tell you the major concern of India. The major concern of India was China. See, the problem that we have and many other countries have with China is that they are not very transparent about how they do business in their country. I'll give you a very simple example. Let's assume there's a mobile phone company that is making a mobile in China. Okay. Now, if a same company is working in India, they're manufacturing mobiles in India, they will have to pay electricity bill, rent on their building, they have to pay salary to their workers, etc. In China, what happens? The Chinese government tells their company, don't pay electricity bill, don't worry. Don't pay a lot of salary to their workers, you can give half the salary to your workers. When the Chinese government says this to their companies, automatically the Chinese company will be able to make the same mobile phone at a cheaper price. Just imagine if the company in India has to give an electricity bill of 1 lakh rupees and the Chinese company does not have to give the electricity bill because the government is giving them subsidy, automatically the price of Chinese mobile will reduce. So when that Chinese mobile comes to India or to some other countries, consumers will buy that product because it is cheaper for them. That is where the problem starts. Because we are not sure about how exactly is it that China does trading. How is it that their government provides this much support? 
Now there is other side of the story as well. Let us assume for a minute that in the RCEP we make a rule that if our product comes in and just take this example, India says if our product comes in from China, we will put 10% taxes. But if our product, let's say, comes in from Indonesia, we will not put any taxes. Let's assume, let's assume that that is a reason. Now, what happens is China will send their products to Indonesia at 0% tax. Then Indonesia will send the same product to India. That also is a big problem. If we don't want Chinese products in India directly, they can still come in indirectly. Because China will send the products to some other country, they will then send it to India. This is where we require something called rules of origin. Rules of origin means it should be clearly mentioned where the product originated. If the product originated in China, then it should be considered as a Chinese product and not a product from Indonesia or Vietnam, etc. All of these are issues that were not resolved as per India. India also wanted that outside RCEP also we should be able to get same kind of treatment or we should be able to give same kind of special treatment to other countries as well. These were certain points on which other countries did not really agree. India thought that our answers, our questions have not been answered rather and that is why we did not sign it at the last day. Although the door is still open, India might sign and become a member of RCEP in the future. But at least for now, we are not a member of the RCEP, mainly because of the presence of China. Maybe if China would not have been there, we would have been happily been a part of that. This was the first article from the Hindu newspaper today. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take those. I'll take a couple of them and then we'll move on to the second important article for the day. There are questions about SEZ and EEZ. These are two separate things. EEZ is exclusive economic zone, as many people have also explained to you in the chat itself. Exclusive economic zone is that area from the coastline that's mainly a water body, where if the minerals are found in that water body, that would be your mineral. So exclusive economic zone will be about 200 nautical miles. So for example, from India's coastline, 200 nautical miles outside that, whatever minerals are found there, they will actually be India's minerals. India has right over it. That is called EEZ, Exclusive Economic Zone. SEZ, Special Economic Zone, is very different. Special Economic Zone, on the other hand, is a specific area which the government has set up, like kind of an IT park or that kind of a thing, where special rules are made to encourage more and more companies to set up their businesses there. Okay? I'll take one more question. What are non-tariff barriers? So non-tariff barrier means how the government can reduce import by not using taxes. For example, the government of India says that if any Indian mobile phone manufacturer sells a mobile, the government of India says we will give you subsidy. But the government does not do the same to any Chinese mobile coming into India. So in short, government of India supports our own local manufacturers by giving them indirect subsidy but not to the others. That is an example of a non-tariff barrier where we are creating a barrier for other products to come to India by having policies which make it difficult for the Chinese products to come to India. For example, we make a rule that if a Chinese product has to come to India, they'll have to sign hundred of forms and sign here, sign there, etc, etc and then they will be allowed. That's a non-tariff barrier. We have not increased taxes, but we have put barriers in their trade. Okay, let's move on then. The second important topic from this Hindu news edition for today is the budget for science and technology more specifically. As I told you earlier as well, for the next few days, be ready to have a lot of articles with regards to budget, with regards to economic survey in the newspaper. Now, the good part is the Ministry of Science and Technology have been given a pretty good allocation. They have been given an allocation of 16,361 crores. The good part is, it is 15% more as compared to the previous year. That is a good way ahead. Most of that budget has been given to Department of Science and Technology. So Ministry of Science and Tech has multiple departments under them. So budget is given first to complete ministry, then it is divided under different departments. 
so from those departments the biggest is given to department of science and technology there are a lot of interesting ideas and there are a lot of interesting areas where government of india is working for example there is a deep ocean mission to explore the deep ocean as the name suggests under which we are trying to develop a deep submersible vehicle deep submersible vehicle would be a small kind of vehicle like a car that can go under the water till the surface of the water so that people can go there and they can actually see if we can explore or exploit certain minerals from the bed source this is the idea of deep submersible mineral that also would require a lot of research so thankfully the government of india has given more money there government of india again the great part is they have realized the importance of science and emerging technologies there have been multiple announcements made in the field of ai artificial intelligence the government of india has said that we will be setting up artificial intelligence labs etc so all of that is a good way forward this is one way of looking at it the other way to look at it is even after all of this india's budget in terms of science and technology is much lower as compared to what the western countries and developed countries spend even after all of this our defa our science and technology budget has not gone beyond 1% of the gdp it's mostly 1% below 1% of the gdp if you look at usual average of india usually we spend about 0.7% of our gdp on the uh, uh, budget for science and tech the problem here is when it comes to research and development developed countries spend much much more money i'll explain this to you earlier as well how research and development is a field that requires a lot more money from the government if you are planning or if you are trying to make a new technology let's say there is a team that is working on making a vaccine for cancer for example they will never be successful in the first attempt obviously let's say in the first attempt they spend a lot of money they make machines etc in the end they fail would the government now tell them don't worry we'll give you the money again start again that is where the difference lies that is why when you say that why is it that developed nations are the ones where discoveries are made why is it that inventions are made in developed nation not in our country that is the biggest reason that in the developed nations when you know that they have enough budget to fail five times even then the sixth time they will get the budget that is the difference in our country when you have told the scientists that no you have only this much money if you can make it work great if you can't make it work we don't know then obviously the research and development would not go ahead now over here there is a big debate and i would like you also to think about a big debate here every year then when we have the budget there is a debate that starts the debate mostly is about the defense budget in india now listen to this very very carefully there are two sections of people in the society one section of people and see let's first as understand the fact everyone in india without any exception support the armed forces there is no one in india who would say no no i don't like the armed forces all of us are patriots all of us support the armed forces all of that is great even then there are two categories of people one category of people especially people working in the armed forces veterans who have retired people who are related to them those people have always demanded a bigger budget for the armed forces however on the other hand there are some people who say that no the defense forces are getting so much money the defense budget is such a huge part of our budget that other sectors do not get enough budget. i'll give you some numbers so that you can understand if you look at the government's expenditure when you when i say government expenditure how much money is a government spending if you look at the government expenditure the biggest expenditure of the government the biggest expenditure the biggest area in which the government spends money is what interest payments the biggest category the loans that the government has taken in the past we are prepaying interest on that that is by far the biggest spending of the government second biggest spending of the government is defense now there is a big debate over defense should we have this budget should we not have this budget now usually 
what we actually spend on the budget, it, it is usually very close to 2% of the GDP. Many armed forces experts say that we should have at least 4% of the GDP, but this is not really feasible in the long run. Because you have to understand there is a very specific sum of money that the government of India has, which they have to spend. One more thing that you have to be very, very careful about. There is a lot of confusion in the minds of the people. When you say 2% of GDP is spent here, 1% of GDP is spent there, please remember GDP doesn't mean government expenditure. When I say 2% of GDP has been spent, GDP is not the amount that the government of India is spending. That is not the case. GDP is the gross developed product. That is mean the entire country. The entire country, how much are we earning? You, me, your boss, your, your parents, the people who work for you, everyone who is earning money, all of that combined would be the gross domestic product. That is the GDP. The government spending is not equal to GDP. So please don't have that confusion. For example, while the defense budget may be close to 2% of GDP, it is about 13% lump sum of the government expenditure or the government budget. So the total budget that the government has, the total expenditure that the government is making, out of that close to 13%, will be the government's ex will be the government's defense budget so if the government is spending 100 rupees out of 120 rupees they are just spending to give back interest payments 13 they are just spending for the defense purposes so please don't think that gdp is a total amount that the government is spending no that is not the case we are only spending 13 percent of our total expenditure on the budget one more thing that you have to understand see when the government of India says that we are spending 2% of the GDP, you have to take something else into consideration as well. Let's take a simple example. Let us assume that last year, just a very simple example, let us assume last year and government spent 2.1% of GDP on budget. Okay, just an assumption. And this year government says we are spending 2% of GDP on the budget. That doesn't always mean that the budget has declined. No, that doesn't always mean this. Why? Because the GDP is also increasing. If last year the GDP was 100, if this year GDP is 120, so 2% one, of 120 will be higher, obviously, <clears throat> than 2.1% of 100. Do you understand this? So when you say 2% of GDP, 1.9% of GDP, 1.8% of GDP, <clears throat> just because as a percentage it is decreasing doesn't really mean it is decreasing in real numbers because the GDP is also increasing year after year after year. So as a percentage of GDP it might be decreasing but in terms of the actual number that is not decreasing. So please also take that into consideration. One other part of the story in the defense budget is if you look at the defense budget that also has two components. One is capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means the budget that we are spending, money that we are spending to buy weapons, right? To buy equipments like Rafal jets, like submarines, like the tanks, etc. Then the other part of the budget is revenue expenditure. That is salary, pension, etc. I'll give you a very simple example. For army, of the total budget that the army has got, of the total budget army has got 70%, 7-0 just goes into salary and pension. Only 30% is left to buy equipment, to buy weapons. That is why and that is a bigger reason why government of India has introduced the Agni Veer scheme, the Agni Pat scheme that you have. The aim of the Agni Pat scheme is to reduce the pension budget of the government in the long run that we are actually reducing the number of people who would be eligible for pension as you know under Agnipat scheme after four years only 25 percent will go ahead and others will have to retire so the government of india is moving in that direction and it is not just the government of india around the world the trend is the same around the world even the developed nations you will see the number of people in the armed forces are coming down 
more and more countries are realizing that we have to spend more money in buying equipment and buying weapons in technology rather than having more people. So it's a trend that we are seeing around the entire world that the budget specifically designed for hiring more people is decreasing and the budget that we have for buying new weapons is increasing. I'll tell you one other interesting part and then we'll go ahead. There are people who say by decreasing the defense budget, you will not be able to win a war. But I have one interesting example for you. Look at the United States of America. USA by far, by far has the largest defense budget in the world. Was that budget enough for them to win a war against Taliban? Just imagine that. Does it mean that having a higher budget would help you win a war? If that was the case, why were they not successful in Afghanistan? So it's not necessary that having a higher defense budget would mostly lead to you winning wars. That is not usually the case. It depends on how you actually utilize that. That is what I want to share about the defense budget as well. Now let's move on to another topic from budget itself. As I told you, next few days are going to be pretty budget heavy. The next article that we have here talks about mainly the budget in different ways. It talks about how the government has increased spending in certain areas and decreased spending in certain other areas. Now, the budget, for example, says that our GDP growth would be close to about 10 and a half percent. That includes inflation as well. I'm sure all of you know what is nominal GDP and what is real GDP. Nominal GDP growth means which includes inflation. If you decrease inflation, if you uh, take out inflation from that, that will be the real GDP growth. As per the government, the real GDP growth would be close to 6.5% in the coming years. Now, the government of India, interestingly, has increased its capital expenditure in the budget. Now, what is capital expenditure? As all of you know, capital expenditure means when you spend money to build certain assets. If you spend money to build roads, if you spend money to build bridges, railway stations, airports, buildings, etc. That is capital expenditure. It is always advised that the government should spend more money on capital expenditure because it will create jobs because you would require people to build those assets so they would get salary and it brings assets to the government in the long run as well. So this is the good part. Even though the government would have to take a lot of loan so even this year the government to fill in their budget deficit would have to take a loan of 15 lakh crore rupees. The expectation was that they will take a much higher loan by the way, but the government has said that we will take a loan of about 15 lakh crore rupees. Having capital expenditure is good for the economy. The government has also said we will reduce expenditure on subsidies, food subsidy, fertilizer subsidy, petroleum, all these subsidies have been reduced. So government is hoping that their expenditure on subsidies will come down and that will get them some money so that they can actually put in more money into capital expenditure. The sad part in India, however, is that the tax is still not improving. The tax collection specifically is still not improving. A very small section of our population still pays income tax. The government of India's tax collection still is not improving. We have a lot of problems of how to allocate that money that the government actually earns. If you remember a few years back, the government of India reduced the corporate tax. When the government reduced the corporate tax for some years, the collection of the corporate tax got reduced, but now that has also improved. There are so many studies that prove the fact that when the government decreases the tax rate, more people will start to pay taxes. So overall, government will be profitable only. For example, if the government today says everyone has to pay 60% tax, then what will happen? Even those who are paying taxes will try to find a way of how to avoid taxes. On the other hand, if the government says, don't worry, you only have to pay 20% tax. Then there's a chance that many more people will pay taxes and this will be beneficial for the government. That is how all the economies around the world work. All of them try to reduce tax rates so that more and more people comply to taxes. This is what happened in corporate tax as well. 
The problem is with the personal tax, as I told you with personal income tax, the government of India did introduce certain changes. If you're earning, you go for the new income tax slab or the new IT scheme under which there have been certain more exemptions given. But even then, that is not enough. There have been many calculations that have been done which prove that even right now, if you see, many people would still want to opt for the old scheme because in the old scheme, you get a lot more exemptions. Now, one very interesting example of what has happened here is that the government of India in this budget has ensured that they do a lot more expenditure. The expenditure mainly is in the form of capital expenditure. A lot of it is going to railways also, which we discussed in the budget uh, video as well, how the railways has gotten a lot more budget. This might increase the government's borrowing as well, and the government borrowing has increased. Government borrowing mainly increased in 2020-21, when the fiscal deficit reached 9.2 percent the reason was covid in the covid 19 lockdown we had to give vaccination to everyone so obviously because of that the market borrowing increase so government is trying to bring it down it will be brought down to 5.9 percent so that is also something the government is doing but again that target of three percent is not being achieved because of what happened at the coronavirus year now this is a table that shows you in different areas how much is the government spending, how much is the government earning. Over here, and you can read the table yourself, I'm not going to detail of that. But I want to make sure all of you understand some very basic terms. There are two or three terms that you will keep on hearing in the budget speech also and read in the newspaper also. I hope all of you are aware of these. First term, BE, budget estimate. Then you have a term called RE, that is the revised estimate. Then there's a term called actuals. I hope all of you know what these terms are. These are very different terms. These tell you a very interesting story. I'll give you an example so that if you don't understand, let's take a simple example, okay? Now, let us assume, and this is just a very ex small example for you to understand. Let us assume in the budget speech, the government of India announced that we will spend 100 rupees on railways. Okay. Let's just assume this. In this year, government announced we will spend 100 rupees on railways. This is an announcement for the next year. That is from 1st of April 2023 to 31st March 2024, that is the next financial year. Government is saying we will spend 100 rupees on railways. This is called budget estimate, BE. This is an assumption that the government will spend. Now let's assume the year starts and then in between the year, the government might not be able to spend this much money. The government says, no, our plans changed or we have to give money somewhere else, some other problem came up, so we are not able to spend this. So when the next budget comes in, the next budget will be when? 1st Feb 2024. In 1st Feb 2024, government will tell that we were not able to spend 100 rupees, we were only able to spend 50 rupees on railways actually. That will be called revised estimate. Revised estimate is when you actually in the next budget tell that in the last year, we were not able to spend that much money because of some reason. But the last year is not over completely. The budget comes in on 1st of Feb. The year ends on 31st of March. So government says we are assuming we will only be able to spend 50 and not completely 100. Then the third figure comes in even later. That is called actual. Actual will be when the government tells actually how much we were able to spend last year. That may be let's say 60, 70, 80 or whatever. These are three different numbers. In simple terms, what I mean to say is, if the government today says in the budget that we will spend 1 lakh crore on railways next year, that doesn't mean that they will compulsorily spend this money. The plans might change because of various reasons. They might spend more, they might spend less also. Those numbers will be told when the next budget comes in and we will be told about that in revised 
estimate and actuals. These are very basic concepts and I am really sure that all of you would have read this in economics. All of you should understand if you have not read this in economics, please make sure you understand it yourself because without this understanding the budget will be impossible. The next article again is with respect to budget more specifically with respect to the Manarega scheme. Now the Manarega scheme and we have discussed this earlier as well is a very interesting example of how the government has been helping population the rural areas specifically. The interesting part is the Manarega schemes allocation has declined. <clears throat> it has been announced that Manarega will this year get 60,000 crore rupees which is a decline as compared to last year. Last year's revised estimate, again revised estimate. So last year government has already spent 89,000 crore on Manarega. And this year they are only getting 60,000 crore. So many questions are asked, is the government looking to uh, shut down the scheme? Why are they doing this? So Mr. Somanathan, Mr. Somanathan is a finance secretary of the government of India. Mr. Somanathan has said that no, Manarega scheme is going fine. We are just assuming or this is a plan that maybe people will not ask for many jobs in Manarega this year. Why? Finance secretary is saying that the government has spent more money on other rural development programs. He says that we have given more money to PM Awas Yojana. We have given more money to Jal Jeevan Mission. So the same people who were asking for a job under Manarega, those people, the secretary is saying, will now ask for a job under other schemes run by the Jal Jeevan Mission, run by the PM Awas Yojana. So we are hoping or we are assuming people who are asking for a job under Manarega will reduce. And that is why the Manarega budget has been reduced as per the union secretary, union's finance secretary. But as I told you earlier as well, just because the government has said that we will spend 60,000 crore on Manarega doesn't mean that it will be fixed. It can increase or decrease also. For example, budget or budget or the government of India clearly tells that Manarega is a demand driven scheme. Manarega is a demand driven scheme. Now, what do you mean by that? Demand driven scheme means if more people demand jobs, Government will have to give them jobs and then the government will spend more money on Manarega. The same happened last year as well and I'll show you the numbers of last year also just to give you an example. The economic survey also says the same thing that number of people asking for jobs in Manarega has reduced. It was very high in the COVID-19 pandemic year when many people lost their jobs in the cities, they moved back to their villages. So they asked for more jobs. Since the pandemic is going away, so lesser people are asking for jobs. So it makes sense not to have a lot of budget under Manarega. These are the budgetary allocations under Manarega. If you see, last year budget estimate was 73,000 crore. Again, last year budget announced that 73,000 crore rupees will be given, but the government has revised it to over 89,000 crore. So every single year the pattern is the same. See, in 2021 budget, government announced 61,000 crore, but they ended up spending how much? Over 1,11,000 crore. Budget of 2022, government announced 73,000 crore will be spent, but they spent 98,000 crore. So the trend is very clear in the past years as well. Government has always spent more on Manarega than what they have said in the budget. This year also the same might happen. They have given 600 crore right now. It might increase depending upon how the year actually goes. These are the numbers so that you can actually understand. Actual is 98,000 crore. That was in 2021-22. Last year's Manarega budget was 73,000 crore. But the government revised it to 89,000 crore. So similarly, this year also from 60,000 crore, we might have a revised estimate for Manarega as well. This is the analysis that we had for you for the Hindu news for today. I hope you liked it. I hope all of you are getting more clarity about the budget, how the budget actually works and these kind of things. Now, there are a couple of questions that I have. Number one, discuss the impact of a reduced budget allocation towards the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Program that is Manarega in 2022-23. Next, 
इंप्रूव ट्रेड विद इन साउथ एशिया मे होल्ड द की फॉर इंडिया इकोनॉमिक रिसर्ज डू यू अग्री क्रिटिकली एनालाइज बोथ दीज क्वेश्चन आंसर विद इन टू फिफ्टी वर्ड ईच यूज आर स्टूडेंट आंसर राइटिंग पोर्टल to write your answers they are give each other feedback learn from each other make sure that as soon as the session ends you go and attend the quiz at our telegram channel which will be based on these articles only i'll see you tomorrow 10 am again with the next hindu newspaper in our hand and analyze that thank you so much for watching have a good day jai hind